فاس و بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين الحمد لله مهيا ويف أستاذ سعيد حسن and I'm Abdul Wahid Stevenson of Medina College of the Dean and we, this is the end of our uh, Muslim series which was six uh, lectures on issues pertaining specifically to Muslim women and their, as they are in the West specifically as well and we thought the best thing to do with the last session is to have a Q&A so for the past five Mondays we've been collecting your questions and we've categorized them underneath Ibadat which is things pertaining to worship then things pertaining to uh, the family, marriage and children. The third category is things pertaining to the dress of the woman, because these were the topics, these were the topics that we did lectures on. And the last one is generally speaking, seeking knowledge and education. So these are the topics. Inshallah, we're going to go over the questions that you sent in and one by one, inshallah, answer them. Uh, and inshallah, we get, get through all of them because there was a lot of questions. And hopefully this is something we want to do uh, regularly, uh, an opportunity for Q&A, whether it's live on, on, on YouTube and you send your questions in during the week. So, yeah, let's begin. Uh, so, the, so the first question, it says, when a woman who is menstruating finishes her cycle, when does she have to restart her prayer? Uh, this is a fit issue for someone who does not menstruate in terms where they have dark discharge. Should this be treated as impure? So that was the first question. Mentioned, uh, we're only going to be going through the questions, or hopefully, we're going to be going through the questions that were sent in or that have been getting sent in for the last four or five weeks. And the topics were obviously those that have been advertised and those that, who's, or those that the lectures have already gone ahead. Um, to be honest, uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive our shortcomings with regards to question and answers, it's not befitting or even with regards to teaching Islamic sciences or giving question and answers, it's not befitting for people like myself to be sitting down and answering questions about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger, questions about uh, the sharia of Islam. The scholars of the past, rahmatullahi alayhim wa rahmatullahi wa sa'a, they seek knowledge for 20, 30, 40 years before uh, answering questions or before teaching the Sharia of Islam. However, nowadays it seems if a person studies for 10 or 15 years, they feel that they are entitled to teach. Uh, and these sorts of questions should be put forward to the scholars. Um, Alhamdulillah, there are many of them and they should be put forward to the scholars. Like in, in Al-Fiqh Al-Islami, there's a qaida, there's a principle called Al-Dawrgatu Tubi'u Al-Mahdawrgat and necessities make permissible that which was impermissible. So may Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala forgive our shortcomings for attempting to even answer, even answer some of these questions. As for the first question, when a woman finishes her menses, she needs to perform Qusul immediately when a woman finishes her uh, menses and she, the blood dries up and there's no longer any blood and the right secre secretion comes out then that is a sign that her haid or her menses has ended what she should do is perform ghusl and then start immediately start praying immediately so methylen if her haid starts or if her haid ends during the time of dhuhr then Alhamdulillah, she needs to perform ghusl and pray dhuhr. If her haid ends during the time of asr, يعني before maghrib, during the time of asr, then she needs to perform ghusl and then pray dhuhr and then pray asr. And the reason why these two prayers are combined is because when a person is traveling or a person is going through difficulty or when it's raining or when there's fear and so on, these two com prayers are combined. So in times of necessity, these two, and in times of uh, uh, reasons or legislative uh, reasons, these two prayers are combined. Likewise, for the woman who ends her hayd during, during the asr prayer, and then she needs to pray zuhur and asr along with na'am, after performing ghusl. If her hayd ends during the time of maghrib, then she only needs to pray Maghrib, she doesn't need to pray Asr, nor does she need to pray, um, nor does she need to pray Isha because its time hasn't started. Uh, 
However, if she, if her Hayd ends at the time of Isha, any time during the time of Isha, whether it's the beginning, the middle or the end, then she needs to perform Ghusl immediately. Then she needs to pray Maghrib first in order. So she needs to pray Maghrib first and then she needs to perform, uh, then she needs to pray Salat al-Isha in that order. And the reason obviously is like we said for Surah Dhuhr and Asr, these two prayers are combined when a person is traveling or when there's a need, when there's rain or when there's snow or when it's extremely cold and so on. So these two prayers are combined. However, if she, if her ghus, if her haid ends during the time of Fajr or before Fajr, then she doesn't need to pray Isha nor does she need to pray Dhuhr. She just needs to perform ghusl and then she needs to pray Salatul Fajr. طيب. If her haid ends, her menses ends and she's out, out of the house, she's at work or she's traveling and she hasn't, or she doesn't have access to water, she needs to uh, wash her private parts, perform tayammum and then pray. That's of course if she fears that the time of the salah will end. If she feels that the time of salah will end. So مثلاً, if she's at work and her haid ends during the time of dhuhr and she is only getting out, she only gets out of work at five-ish. طبعاً, the time of dhuhr or the time of dhuhr will have ended. So she has to pray, dhuhr, she has to wash her private parts, perform tayammum and then pray uh, Salatul Dhuhr because obviously she doesn't have access to water and it's not entirely up to her. She doesn't have a choice when her Hayd ends. As for the woman who doesn't menstruate, whether it's due to uh, old age or whether it's due to a medical issue uh, and she experiences or she sees a dark discharge as we see in the question, then obviously this isn't Hayd, lacking it is impure. It is not, it is najasa, it is impure and it nullifies the wudu. So she only has to clean herself and then make wudu and then pray from that point onwards. The last issue is if her haid starts, so the first point was when her haid ends. If her haid starts during the time of salah, and the time of salah has already entered and then her haid starts does she need to repeat the question does she need to repeat the salah so mathalan salat al starts at 12 o'clock and then it ends at mathalan 140ish and that's the time of asr if her haid starts after the time of dhuhr mathalan it starts at 12:15 12:30ish 1 o'clockish and then her haid starts she doesn't need to repeat or make up that, that prayer salah. that salah yeah. Because the wajib is muwassa, the time is fast, so yeah. she doesn't need to make it up. However, if she delayed the time of salah till until there was about five or ten minutes left, so mathalan if the time of asr starts at 1.40 and she finds that she hasn't prayed at 1.30, 1.28, 1.30ish, and then her haid starts, the scholars say that that specific salah she needs she to make it up after her haid ends. Because there was a shortcoming from her in delaying the prayer more than its correct time. Yeah. Wallahu a'lam. Barakallahu uh, feekum. I just want to point out and highlight that uh, when it comes to answering questions, um, there's there's two important principles here. Number one, if you don't know something, you say la adri, and that's half of knowledge. Uh, as is one on about Imam Malik, he, someone came to him, traveled far, asked loads of questions, and he said la adri to the majority of them. Uh, and that's very important. The second aspect that I want to highlight here is that these questions were sent in and we had time, we were able to, uh, or Sayyid Hassan was able to do the research to look up the answers. It was not questions where every question you're asked on the spot you give an answer, right? So research is done and there's a masala called tawakkuf as well. Sometimes if you don't know you say I make tawakkuf and give a judgment or giving a verdict until things become clear to me, right? So there's not, there's not a need to answer every question you're asked or to, you can say, wait a minute, I'll go make research. And this was what we learned from the ulama, from the scholars. You'd ask them a question, uh, and I'm sure you experience the same. You'd think it's a straightforward answer. And the sheikh is an alim kabir. He would say, I'll get back to you. Let me go back to the books and stuff like that. And that's a tarbiyah that is essential. Now, uh, my sister has istihada, and she starts to pray again after a number of days 
she menstruates is complete. After the number of days she menstruates is complete. When shall she make ghusl? At midnight, so the beginning of the day, she comes off her period. Before the Fajr Salah of the day, she is off, or the day, or before the Dhuhr Salah. Jazakallahu khayran. Um, the answer will come in detail in the question number four or five, I believe. However, what she should do is, for example, if she's going through dhamr istihada, which is abnormal bleeding, it's not menses blood, nor is it postnatal bleeding. It's called istihada, which is abnormal bleeding. So what she should do is, if she's counting the number of days that she usually experiences her haid, so method and she usually experiences her haid, or if she usually experiences her haid from the first to the seventh of every month, then on the seventh, that's her last day of haid. Yeah. The night of the eighth, she needs to perform ghusl and then start to pray. So the, fir the, the first prayer that she'll be praying is on the eighth on day, the eighth. which is Salatul Fajr. Wallahu okay. alam. Uh, next question. My menstrual cycle ended after Isha prayer. I did not do ghusl in time for Fajr the next day, but I did before Dhuhr Salat. If I made intention to fast that day, will my fast be valid? Sunnah fast, of course. There's two aspects to this question. The first being her delaying the Fajr prayer yeah. when she was dahir, when, she, when her menses has ended, and then the aspect of the fasting. So with regards to the Fajr prayer, what she should have done is she performed ghusl after her after when she ended her Haid, she should have performed Ghusl and then prayed Fajr. So for now, she needs to make up that specific Salah. Even yeah. now, that specific Fajr, she needs to make that Salah up because that's the time that she ended her Haid. Yeah. As for the fasting, the, her fasting is fine because it is not a condition of fasting that one has to be uh, on wudu or clean from Janaba and so on. Yeah. As long as her Haid has, had ended, yeah. then it's fine, her fasting is sound. When, next question, when starting contraception, some women experience irregular bleeding and spotting that can last weeks to months. What's the ruling with regards to prayer, fasting and intimacy? Again, for this question, there's two aspects. There's the contraception issue and then there's the, um, there's the issue to do with the uh, demul istihada. There's the issue to do with demul istihada. With regards to the contraception, that's going to come anyway. Um, in the seventh question, like in, what she's going through is demul istihada, which is abnormal bleeding. Right. As for abnormal bleeding, it's obviously different to, or demul istihada is different to demul haid. Not only in terms of its traits, obviously demul haid is dark and it has a th uh, it's thick and it has a foul smell. Demul istihada is not like that, it's obviously red and it doesn't have a foul smell, it's different in terms of attributes or traits. Lacking, it's also different in terms of the ahkam. So when a woman is menstruating, she's not allowed to pray, she's not allowed to fast, she's not allowed to have intimacy with her husband. Lacking with demul istihada, it's different, it's prolonged bleeding or abnormal bleeding as the scholars call it. So she has to fast, she has to pray. And she can have, have abnormal, uh, she can have intimacy with her husband. Like she has to perform wudu for every salah. She has to perform wudu for every salah. And if she is going for haid, there are three types. If she is going for istihada, there are three types. Al-Mu'tada, Al-Mu'tada'a, and Al-Mumayiza. The Mu'tada uh, mu is the one who uh, previously experienced haid, or who previously used to experience haid. So it was method, for example, six days of every month. Yeah or seven days of every month. So if she's going through demul istihada, which is constant abnormal bleeding, she needs to uh, leave off the salah and the fasting for those six months or six days or seven days that she used to leave off the salah normally. So for example, the first to the seventh. Yeah. And then on the seventh day, as we said, highlighted, on the eighth night, on the night of the eighth, the eighth day, then she needs to perform ghusl and carry on from there. As for the mubtada, the and the one who hasn't had exper experience um, menses before and then she, all she sees is constant bleeding then she needs to look at the the tamiz, look at the actual the type of blood yeah. if it's the blood of haid then she needs to carry on as if it is haid for the number of days of the usual haid and if it is not then it is called dam istihada and the same for that for, for those who um, Mathal and have forgotten how many days they used to perform Haid. As for the Mumayyizah, then the third category, she is the one that is able to differentiate between the blood of the Haid and the blood of the Menses. menses. Uh, the blood uh, of the Haid and the blood of the Istihada. So menses. during the day, times of Istihada, 
she should leave off the salah, the fasting, and D the during the times of during the hayd. times of hayd, she leaves off. She leaves off the salah, the fasting, yeah. and then during the time of istihada, she fasts and she. Um, and the third, and I think, is there the other one, man, la ada la hawala tamiyiz? Yeah, that's the third one, that's the third one. The third one. The mumayiz, oh, the mumayiz mentioned. Be mentioned. Okay, no. good. Uh, if my menstruation lasts over a month, am I allowed to start praying and fasting? Uh, you have to start praying and fasting. It, that is abnormal bleeding, that's and the answer is... In the previous, previous one. The previous when a woman question. gives birth, she can bleed up to 40 days. When does she start praying? When a woman uh, gives birth, that blood is called demun nifas. Demunifas. Postnatal bleeding. Uh, postnatal bleeding. And the scholars talk about the issue of the minimum and the maximum time that it, she goes through. Um, uh, demul, uh, demunifas. So the scholars say, or the Jumhur, the majority of the scholars say that it's 40 days. That it is 40 days. Like in many of the scholars say that the ibra, or what is the benchmark, or what is given consideration, is blood. So even if, as long as she sees blood coming out, after giving birth, then that is considered demun nifas. Whether it's 30 days, whether it's 20 days, whether it's 45 days, up until 60 days. And that's the method of Imam Shafi and Ibn Taymiyyah and so on. And the reason why they say 60 days is because after 60 days, that blood is it's, it's, it's a marad. It's a type of illness. illness. It's abnormal yeah. bleeding. Demun facade. Demun facade. So it's not demun nifas. Yeah. So up to 60 days. Like in any time within these 60 days, as long as she's seen the blood come out, then that is called, that is considered demun nifas. So it can be more than 40 days, up until 60 days, or it could be less. So as soon as she sees the blood, she sees the blood has stopped, that's when she performs ghusl and uh, she starts to pray, starts to fast and so on. Okay, next question. What is the ruling on contraceptive implants, IUD, etc.? Uh, all of, everything that prevents alham, uh, is pregnancy. permissible. Yeah. Everything that prevents pre pregnancy is permissible as long as it doesn't cause harm, long term harm, and it doesn't have any uh, major side effects. Because every. To have small uh, side every, effects. Yeah, if it has yeah. small side effects, so I like it. If it has a lot of side effects and they're harmful, then it is not permissible due to the, due to the hadith. La dara wa la dara. As for the permissibility of the types, different types of contraception, then the hadith of Jabi kunna nazil wal Quran yanzil. Yeah. We would um, uh, come. Uh, we wouldn't. We would practice uh, 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 interruptus. Inter yeah, now, up until while the Quran would, while the Quran was being revealed. So the Mahal Shahid is if it was haram, then Allah Subhanahu wa Taala would have informed the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to tell them that it is was it was haram. So all of the other types of contraception are we make qiyas or the scholars make qiyas analogy yeah. of. All of the other types of uh, uh, contraceptive uh, oh. kind of methods to the same as what was practiced during the time of yep. the Sahaba Ridwana Ta'ala alayhim. Lakin, there's a condition which is that the Zawj and the Zawja have to both be okay and uh, happy with uh, them using contraception. Lakin, if the wife is not uh, doesn't agree to it then it's not permissible for the husband to use contraception and if the husband doesn't agree to it it's not, not permissible, permissible for the, uh, the the wife to use contraception and that's the fatwa of Sheikh Ibn Uthaymi yeah. and you can find it on YouTube Allahu uh, Can I recite the Quran and my adhkar whilst I'm on my period? No, you can recite the Quran and recite the, uh, the adhkar with the dua, the morning and the afternoon duas and so on um, whilst one is on the period, on her period, and also touch the mushaf if there's a need, if there's a need for her to touch the mushaf, and it would obviously be better to use a glove or type of material. Allah uh, If there's urine stains on a bed in a room, can I pray my salah in there? So it's not, yeah, it's on the it's bed. No, nah, it's fine. You can pray in that room because what is necessary for salah is that the person's body, the person's clothing. And the place of prayer, yani the sajaya that they're praying on, the prayer mat that they're praying on, is pure. Yeah. As for any of the surroundings, then it is not conditioned. Uh, so with pure. regards to tahara, when a woman is ovulating and the eggs drops on her underwear, she should, should she change her underwear before prayer? No, she should clean her underwear or change it and then perform wudu. Does, this, does, this, does this charge break wudu? No, everything that comes out of the private parts, the scholars say, al kharij min al everything that comes out of the private parts, whether it's them, hayd, nifas, 
rotobat or yani moist and damp and so on, istihada, then all of that nullifies the wudu and that's the fatwa of Shaykh ibn Taymin rahimahullah ta'ala rahmatullah. Okay, the hadith that you mentioned at the beginning regarding the believer men and women, this is related, obviously related to the lecture, are identical twins to one another. <laughs> Can this hadith also be used as a delil to show that the prayer of the men and women are the same? As some people claim the prayer of the women is different from that of a man. Um, with regards to the awamig and the nawahi, with regards to the commandments and the prohibitions, the men and the women are exactly the same. So the fact that salah is wajib upon both of them, and the fact that they have to pray five daily prayers, and the fact that dhuhr is four and asr is four, and so on. From these sort of, from this aspect, then it is wajib upon uh, both of the male and the female, and there is no differentiation between how they pray. However, in the ahkam of the Sharia, ah, there are certain things that are in tabiat al hal that is going to be different. For example. Uh, the ahkam of hayd, for example, hajj, when they're doing ihram, men do the ihram yani wearing two white garments. Like in women, they don't obviously wear these two white garments. So there are things that are different in the prayer of the woman that um, would be different with the prayer of the man. For example, the awra. Yeah. The awra, what the man has to cover, is different to what the, the woman, woman has to cover. cover. The woman has to cover the whole body, minus the face and the hands. Whereas the man, uh, it's up to the, from the navel to the knee and also covering one's shoulders. Also, there are certain differences. For example, a, a woman can't lead men in prayer. Also, when it comes to correcting the men or correcting the imam, women, they, clap. Yeah, yeah. they clap. They don't obviously say subhanallah. Likewise, when a woman is leading another woman, like when men are leading men, then the man, the imam stands at the front. Like in women, as the hadith of Aisha and the other com uh, companions of the Messenger uh, the woman stands in the middle of the oh, prayer. Of the prayer. Uh, naam, in the, in the, the, the riddle of the row. Yeah, yeah. In the riddle of the saf. So there are certain things that are different in terms of how men pray and how women pray. Like, you know, I think what the person is referring to is in terms of when they're performing a record and when they're performing sujood, then that is obviously going to be the same. Like, and it's important to know that when a woman is praying, she needs to pray. Uh, she should, as much as she can, pray away from where there are men because she's going to be kneeling down, bending down and so on. Sometimes you see them doing demonstrations in central London, Trafalgar Square and the women are praying, yeah, 30, 40 of them are praying yeah. and they're all going down for Rukur and they're all going down for Sujood. Yeah. Uh, what advice or guidance from Qur'an Aswana would you give to someone who is struggling narcotic addiction? Well, the first that person has to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and know that this is haram and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited this and the prohibition comes back, the, or the benefit of that prohibition comes back to the person because narcotics and drugs and so on, they harm the person. Also, this individual should purify his heart, increase his iman because this action is only happening because his iman is weak. So this person should try purifying his heart and increase his iman. Also, leave the company that he's keeping if it's the company that he's keeping that are convincing him or encouraging him to do so, then he should change company. Like the man who killed 99 men. Yeah. When he came to the, to, the, to the monk, the Abid, he said, is there a tawbah for me? He said, no, and he killed him as well. Like yeah. when he came to the Alim, the scholar, the scholar said to him, uh, there's tawbah for you, what's preventing you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's repentance? Like in leave the land that you are yeah. in. So that person should repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prevents him from this dua and also his salah inna salata tanha anil fahshai wal munkar inna al hasanat yudhibna sayyat so if a person concentrates on his ibadah and his salah this will encourage him to stay away from this will be a deterrent for him to stay away from drugs and so on uh, billah. and if it does happen that he falls into it again then he shouldn't give up in the, on the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mm. he should repent again and again and again it may be that he dies in a state of repentance and then Allah Jalla wa ala forgives him for his shortcomings yeah. Wallahu a'lam Also I'll just, I'm just going to add if it's a narcotic and you know you need to get medical help as well uh, that's also I think is important if it's an addiction which is narcotic and there's a way where you know there's they may have means and methods uh, don't close that door completely but understand that your dependence is upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Okay if a person has broken an oath multiple times do they need to make an expiation for all those times or just once? Um, with regards to uh, another, it is makruh, as the scholars say. Uh, it is makruh, wala yat tabi khayrin. 
right and it doesn't it, it doesn't bring goodness it only brings takes something out from the pocket of the of the stingy person stingy. Yeah. Now, so it's not befitting that a person does that a lot anyhow lacking like if a person does make a vow then vow then it's wajib for him to keep that vow if they are not able if they are not able and they have already done it um, then they need to obviously repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like, and they need to obviously expiate for that طيب. as for how to expiate if a person has said it over, the same vow over and yeah. over again the same vow yeah. without expiating then they can, need can to can we just give an example of a vow so it's clear so for example someone says what's an example uh, مثلا, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cures my uh, or if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cures this individual for me then I'm gonna uh, fast, fast, yeah. مثلا, yeah. Free, uh, fast ten days, مثلا. Yeah. and then Allah subhanahu and then he, this person constantly repeats it and so on. And then Allah subhanahu wa taala cures this individual, yeah. and he doesn't make it up. Yeah. And then he does it again. Yeah. And then he does it again. Now, if he has done it so many times and he's broken, he hasn't done what Allah subhanahu wa taala what he promised to do, then he only makes one expiation. Yeah. He only makes one yeah. expiation. Lacking if he's already done expiated from the previous vow. Yeah. He's already expiated, done the kafaga, yeah. and he does it again, yeah. and he needs to expiate again, do a kafaga for the new vow that he's, done. New vow yeah, he's done. It that he has done. That's yeah. if it is the same. Yeah. Like if it's two different things, like the illness, illness was one thing, like in Methalan, if I pass this exam, I'm gonna, Methalan, uh, pay 100 pounds of sadaqah. Yeah. Or he says, for example, uh, you know, well, I'm never going to wear a particular type of chains again. A particular type of chains. No. And then he wears them again afterwards. And he wears them again afterwards. Yeah. So if he, that's obviously two different ones. Yeah. The reason is the mujib yeah. is different. The mujib is different. So therefore he has to expiate for this and expiate for that. For that. Yeah. Right? And as for what he should do, obviously feed 10 masakin or clothe them, feed them or clothe them. Uh, what is enough to cover their aura or free a slave. Now, if he's not able to do any of these after trying after trying then he should fast three yeah. days for the kafaga a kilo and a half and so on so it'd be about 15 kilos of food he can give it to a charity organization yep. if he's sure that it's going to reach the yeah. poor people that need yeah that and what you like you mentioned you emphasized and i want to repeat it is that he has to try the first two first it shouldn't first go straight three, no. to the fasting no basically. he should try the first three, three first, first. Uh, the, the, obviously the, yeah. the, the slave not yeah, so like fast. in the first two you're yeah. right yeah you should try them first because people just go to fasting you're straight right, away you're right yeah people go to fasting that's not correct i've recently learned that when air exists even if not gas from inside the body but just air that this invalidates wudu this makes it hard for me to maintain wudu especially when i'm outside of my house is the ruling different across madhabs i follow shafi madhab so to clarify i would like to know if when tiny bubbles of air can be felt in the back passage and sometimes it exits does this break the wudu uh the scholars say that if wherever it ex exits the two private parts nullifies, nullifies. the wudu wherever it exits the two private parts nullifies the wudu like Sheikh Sulaiman says in the fatwa that he was asked a similar question if it's constant then she can make wudu every time a salah comes in and then she, she maintains her wudu for the duration of that salah yeah. and then when the next salah comes in she makes wudu again and she maintains the salah method and uh, she maintains the wudu for the duration of that period and that is because of the necessity and the al-mashaqat to tajribu taisik difficulty brings about ease like and i'd like to point on the, the issue which she said is the ruling different across madhab when a person is asking a question they should ask for what is in accordance with the quran and the sunnah mm. or what is the stronger opinion they shouldn't ask for a ruchas concessions what is the ruling on this in this madhab and this madhab and I follow this madhab La, the, 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 the question the person the sa'il yeah. should ask for the strongest opinion which is obviously what is closest to the stuqran and, and the sunnah, sunnah. Like, yeah. and they shouldn't ask about the different madhab in terms of unless it's if a person is studying in, yeah. in a classroom yeah, in a classroom and for yeah. that um, there are some foods mainly sweets chocolates that like M&M's or Smarties the m &M question that contain carmine and I don't know how to pronounce this word. Cochineal. This type of coloring derived from it's a type of covering coloring derived from insects. Is it halal or haram? Uh, Not insects, the yeah. m ms or the yeah. Because the, uh, the, the, in fiqh al-Islami, there's something called istihala, yeah. which it changes form. So 
it's no longer the, 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 the chemical or whatever it was previously. So it's fine yeah. to eat because this the hal, it has changed it. It's no longer that thing anymore. That thing anymore. Same for gelatin? No, some of the scholars say uh, the same for gelatin because it is no longer gelatin. It yeah. has changed. If it's no form, longer the, it's no longer no, the animal due form. to the chemicals that have been put in there and so on. Okay. It's only there. They have to obviously put a legal requirement to put it on. To put it on the thing. Okay. Ingredients. Uh, in the Tahara section of Umda al Fiqh, Sheikh Khalid mentioned. So this is the the Alamia course, which is on the portal where they got where the Mashaykh, like Shaykh Khalid Mashaykh and other them, and them go through Mutun al ilmiya So this is for students of knowledge. In the Tahara section of Umdat al Fiqh, Shaykh Khalid mentioned the Qullatain for differentiating between large amounts of water and small amounts. Could you explain how much this is in litres, please? I don't think it was mentioned in the lecture. Uh, no, in litres it's 200 litres roughly. Okay. 200 litres. And when they're talking about Al-Ma'ul Kathir, there's different definitions to it, like in roughly about 200 litres. Uh, and they say, some, some of the scholars say, some of the fuqaha, that it's so big that if you touch one part, if you move one part of it, then the other part doesn't move. Yeah. Then the other part doesn't move. Like, and there's a masala which is more important than that, which is uh, the, the khilaf that's uh, surrounding al-ma'ul kathir wa ma'ul qalil. Yeah. But I don't know if we have time to just... Yep, yep, yep. So, yeah. for it, so mathal, and the scholars, when they talk about this masala, there's a lot of khilaf on the, uh, this masala between uh, hadith of Qulatayn and the had and so on. So they say that if the najasa falls into, if there's a najasa uh, impurity and it falls into ma'al kathir, a lot of water, al-ma'al kathir, and it doesn't change its smell, its color, or its color, its smell, what was the third? Taste. Or the taste. Or the, yeah, or the color, the taste. Or the yeah, color, the right. taste. Na'am, yeah. then that ma'al that ma or that water is yeah. pure. The second one is if it falls into, if the najasa falls into a lot of water and it changes any one of these three traits, uh, whether it changes the taste, the color, or uh, the smell, then that is najasa bil ijma as well. Yeah. Lakin the khilaf is in if there's a najasa and it falls into a minute amount of water, which is less than 200 yeah. liters. There's a khilaf and they say, does the water become najas immediately? Is it all immediately najasa, uh, najis, or do we look at the old saf, whether these traits have changed, whether the smell has changed, or whether the, uh, the, 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 the taste and so on. That's where the khilaf is in this mas'ala. And the reason is because there's two hadiths. There's a hadith qullatayn, إِذَا بَلَغَ الْمَاءُ قُلَّتَيْن لَمْ يَحْمِلْ If the hadith of Sa'id, if the water reaches two qullatayn, uh, and 200 litres, it doesn't keep Najis, yeah, yeah. and there's the hadith of the Mantuq, which is hadith of Umar in the Ma'at, the Najis who say water is pure and nothing makes it impure. Yeah. So the khilaf is, and the mafhum of this hadith, the understanding you derive from this hadith is that if the water is less than 200 litres, it becomes Najis by, it becomes najis najis, by yeah. default. Yeah. Like in the Mantuq of this hadith, what is mentioned in the actual hadith, the wording of the hadith illustrates, yeah. it points to the fact that water is pure no matter what, mm. unless obviously it's, it changes, it, yes. unless it changes form. Yeah. So that's obviously a masala. And the scholars say that the second opinion is stronger that what is looked at or what is considered is the water itself. If, yeah. itself. if it changes, if there's najasa that falls into it and it changes either the taste, the color or the smell, then it becomes najis. If it doesn't change it, then it is dahir. Wallahu a'ana. Okay, next question. During postnatal bleeding, does this mean one should not pray until this period is over? Is that equivalent to 40 days? That's a, That's a question that we, we answered. Yeah. answered. Lakin, what I want to point out is the, 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 the 40 days. So, yeah. Mathalan, uh, what she should take into consideration, or what the woman should take into consideration, is the blood. Yeah. If there's blood, then there's yeah. She doesn't pray and she doesn't fast and so on. That is Hayd yeah. nifas uh, Afan, Dem nifas uh, postnatal bleeding. Mm. Whether it's within the 40 days, it could end after the 30th days, 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 it could yeah. end after 15, 10 20, days. The now, days she might, may not experience Dem yeah. uh, nifas Like in what is taken into consideration, what she has to look at is if there's blood or not. If mm. there's blood, then there's obviously, uh, she can't pray, that is Dem nifas postnatal bleeding. Yeah. Even if it reaches 40 days, 43 days, 45 days, and so on. And the consideration is the fact that it, this is the nifas. Like, if it reaches 60 days, then we know, we're sure, we're sure that we're certain that this is abnormal. Yeah. 
Yeah. That this is abnormal. abnormal. As for the hadith of Um Salama, I believe it was, that said during the time of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that the Hayd, the, 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 the majority of women used to have their nifas for 40 days. That's the ghalib. Yeah. That's the ghalib. That is what was uh, common amongst yeah. those women. Like in uh, the human body is ajib and it, so, it, it depends on, it varies from a person who's in a warm country and a person who's not, not in yeah, a warm yeah. country and it depends on the things. food and there's a lot yeah. of different angles or yeah. aspects of reasons why the time could differ. Allahu alam. Uh, next question, I wanted to ask a question in regards to organ donation. There's only a small chance that someone qualifies as an organ donor, 5%. Some of the requirements for organ donors is that they don't drink or smoke and are in a healthy condition. If there's no chance or a very low chance of survival for the organ donor, is it permissible to donate your organs in Islam? Right. Before I go into the answer of that question, um, the question, as you wrote, was one, two, three, four, five lines. Yeah. Like, everything in the first three lines, first four lines, has no connection to the answer or to the question at all. Okay, good. Yeah, so yeah. that's just the point I want to point out. Yeah, it's important. Etiquette, so answering, asking a question. Yeah. So sometimes a person will come to a sheikh and say, um, I had an argument with my husband and then he took the children and then when he took the children, he took them up to, he took them to school and then when he took them to school, he came back home and, and we had an argument and then he went out for Salat al-Zuhur and when he came back for Salat al-Zuhur, we had another heated argument and then he said, you're divorced. Yeah. Now, everything to do with the children, him taking them to school, going out for dhuhr, all of that is nothing to, to do, do with, with the question. The doesn't, question. It doesn't have anything. No, yeah, it doesn't. So, so just to make it easier for people, it might be easier just to get to the main the, 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 the question, the, 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 the ruling question, that you're looking the, for. The, the ruling that you're looking for. So, yeah. so in this question, we can summarize, is it permissible to donate organs, organs yeah. in Islam? So, yeah. When you short summarize it. This is a masala which is contemporary, Mouse, obviously. Yeah. Uh, the scholars have differed upon it, have differed upon uh, this mas'ala. Some have taken tawaqqaf, some haven't answered, such as Sheikh uh, Ibn Baz, yes. Some say it's completely haram. Sheikh Albani, alayhi, Sheikh Muhammad Fakus, Hafidhullah, who is from the scholars of Algeria, yeah, yeah, one a scholar and yeah. faqih. Yeah. Um, so he says it is impermissible, uh, okay. except in the tight circumstances. And obviously they use la dara wa la dira, and the fact that we've been commanded to perform, uh, to look after this body, because obviously it is not ours. Wa la tunqu bi aidikum ila tahluka, do not throw yourselves into destruction. So they use these sorts of evidences. Then there are those scholars that say it is permissible. There are those scholars that say that it, that it is permissible and I believe some of the Majami' al-Fiqiyah they yeah. say it's permissible um, Sheikh Salih al-Fawzan, Sheikh Suleiman al and other scholars yeah. say it's permissible lacking with conditions yeah. with conditions and these conditions are extremely important and the reason why they say it's permissible is because that is Ihsan yeah. that is Ta'awun al bir wa Taqwa that is Ihsan yeah. So there's a, there are conditions the first is an la yakunu hunaka darun ala al manqulim minhu yeah. There is no harm that will come to the person who's donating. And then in that they talk about uh, the different type of organs. Of so organs, yeah. if a person says, I'm going to donate my heart, yeah, it's not you know, it's not suicide. It's, it's suicide yeah. Exactly. Or if he says, I'm going to donate my nose in any way, then it's not <laughs> permissible. Uh, or if someone says any other part of the body, which yeah. is only one organ, yeah, that, you're dependent upon then yeah. that is not permissible. Lacking like for those organs that are two, they say that there has, if there's no harm that is going to be yeah. formed. And this is why he's alive, obviously. That, that's it, yeah. why he's alive, yeah. obviously. Now, so if there's no person that is, uh, methyl and, um, if, the, if there's going to be no harm, yeah. then it's permissible to donate because there's no harm coming to him, number one. Yeah. Secondly, the person that it's being donated to has to benefit from it. Yeah. And it has to be, we have to be sure that this person is going to benefit. Like if a person, مثلا, if a kidney is taken out from A, and then when they try to put it in B, they realize that it's not possible for him to even have, have a kidney. Yeah. Then we've obviously taken it out of this one, yeah. and this one can't benefit from it. And also, it has to be that the person has to be jaiz or tasawuf. Yeah. That is, a person has to be someone who is allowed to uh, make decisions, someone that is aqil, and that is of age, someone that is sane. So, method and children, youngsters can't say yeah. they're gonna uh, donate their, their, their organs yeah. to, to, to family members because they don't know what they're doing. Also, an insane person yeah. can't say, I'm gonna donate um, my organs. From there, we see the hikmah and the wisdom of the sharia of Islam, whereby you will find youngsters nowadays having. Um, they're going through 
um, what's this thing called transgender? Uh, they're yeah. going through, uh, مثلا, they change their gender, gender. and they're young, yeah, and they're yeah. very young age, and they're not able to make the decisions, make the decision. and yeah, then yeah, some of them regret it, regret okay. it. So and undo it afterwards. Uh, undo it and yeah. afterwards. So that shows the conditions that the scholars yeah, make. Uh, the, the conditions that the scholars pay, place are placed there for a reason. Then there are those that say, what about after the person that dies? That's also a masala. Is yeah. it permissible for us to take out his organs? Mm. Some say it's not permissible. For those that say it's permissible yeah. to donate in general, those that say it is don't, permissible to donate in general, they say no, it's not permissible because now he isn't Jaisa Tasawwuf. Yeah. He isn't someone that can make decisions on it. Now. Yeah. And then there are those that say there's khilaf amongst, yeah, there's khilaf amongst them, them. On, on that issue. Like oh, it, these yeah. sorts of issues, they need to go to. Uh, these sorts of individual, these sorts of questions can't be answered generally. Yeah, they need to be go to. They need to go to a sheikh specifically and mention all the circumstances yeah. surrounding it. Yeah. Inshallah, just on this point, uh, hopefully something might be published soon. Anyway, Inshallah. looking at the differences and stuff like that. Inshallah. I have a question on the issue of making up miss fast when pregnant. I previously read to both make up fast and pray the and pay the fidya to do both. I am now unsure what opinion to make. Not to make up fast. I'm assuming it all pay the fidya. Mm -hmm. I'm now unsure what opinion to take and how do I know I'm following desires. I've missed one for Ramadan due to pregnancy. Was able to fast the next Ramadan, although I was breastfeeding, but haven't made up any days. This Ramadan I'll also not be able to fast due to pregnancy, meaning, meaning I will accumulate over 60 days. If I only have to pay the fidya, which I did for my first Ramadan missed, are my fasts missed from the previous Ramadan wiped? i.e. those when I thought I had to pay fidya and make up the fast. The woman that's breastfeeding or the woman that is pregnant, uh, the stronger opinion, Wallahu A'lam, that Abdullah ibn Abbas and Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhumah both gave fatwa to, is that they need to pay fidya for every day that they miss. They pay fidya, they pay a free uh, a poor person or they feed a poor yeah. person for every day they are not able to fast during the month of Ramadan. So, yeah. Mathal, and she's pregnant and she can't fast during the month of Ramadan. For every day that she misses, she feeds a poor person. Secondly, she doesn't need to make up those days that she is feeding a poor person for. So, no qada basically. There's no qada. She yeah. doesn't need to make up these days. Tayyip. As for what the sister, the, the, the situation that she's mentioned, it seems like she's got 60 days to make up. Or which is, no, not 60 days, 30 days in the past, the yeah. Ramadan beforehand. Yeah. And this Ramadan that's coming, I believe, she's yeah. referring to. Yeah. She needs to feed a poor person for every day in the previous Ramadan. Yeah. The previous Ramadan. Lacking for this Ramadan, for this Ramadan, she mentions she's. Pregnant, I believe. Yeah, this Ramadan. She said that she's going to For be. this Ramadan, she feeds a poor person in in Ramadan during Ramadan. So, مثلا, she can't feed a poor person from the beginning of the month. Why? Because the wajib hasn't taken place yet. It is not wajib at that point. Right, so yeah. Like, like in, if she wants to feed a poor person every day on a daily basis, yeah, that's fine. Give iftar to a poor person, poor person. on a daily basis, or after every five days. Or every 10 days, that's yep. fine, as long as the time has passed and that it is wajib upon her. So in that's summary, good. she needs to feed a poor person for every day that she has missed. Every day that she has missed due to pregnancy or due to breastfeeding where she fears for herself or for her child. Okay. Right. As for her not following desires, then she has to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, obviously make dua that she isn't yeah. following desires. Allah okay, Allah. alhamdulillah, those are all the questions pertaining to ibadat, which is obviously the salat and uh, everything connected to salam and zakat and hajj. The next set of, set of questions now are all about zawaj and the house, the home and, and the kids. So the first question here is how to accept a husband having a second wife and make oneself's heart clean. How can I have sabr as I cannot tolerate my husband with someone else? But there are circumstances that now he has to marry her and I can't do anything about it. Please guide me. Firstly, the women have to know that this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has legislated for the men. And it's obviously understandable that no woman will be able to accept it all. It's not easy for any woman to accept her husband getting married again. Like she has to be 
patient with the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, make dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it easy for her and Allah jalla wa ala gives her patience and she has to know that this is something that Allah jalla wa ala has made permissible that also it may be that her husband ends up loving her more more than before and it may be that there's more bagaka in it and she also knows that in their marriage and she also has to know that this is the son of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam our noble messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam he had nine wives uh, like in everyone else in this ummah is only allowed four wives and it is not as women think as well many women think that if the man gets married again that he there's a problem with the first wife that isn't the case that's not the case it doesn't mean he doesn't love her it doesn't mean there's something wrong with her like in this is something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created in the children of Adam the men of Adam uh, the sons of Adam and it's something that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made permissible for them uh, also what they should do is women in general should fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we find in a lot of situations where if a man gets married all of the other women of the community whether it's her friends whether it's um, her family members her mother they encourage her to get a, a divorce, divorce. Yeah. they encourage her to get a divorce and the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam prohibited us from prohibited the women from asking for a divorce for no particular for no reason, reason. i yeah. believe it was an authentic hadith that she doesn't uh, smell the the fragrance of jannah if she asks yeah. her husband for a divorce without there being any reason so women in general they need to fear allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and not encourage one another to um uh, for, to, to ask for their divorce when their husband goes through uh, or when their husband gets married also it's important for the men to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well and just because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made something permissible it doesn't mean that it is right for you at that particular time or it doesn't mean that you're able to uh, commit to all of the obligations that come about with uh, come around with marrying a second or third wife there comes great responsibility so a person has to be able to cope with the responsibility and he has to be able to give the right to his first wife and the second wife and the third wife also the men have to take into consideration or the man has to take into consideration when he is getting married because that is a major factor into uh, how they find rectification afterwards so methylene if he gets married or we find a lot of brothers getting married when the sister's pregnant, when his wife's pregnant, mm. or when she's just about to give birth, or when she's given birth, mm. or when she's ill. Mm. If you do that, she's already going through physical pain, you've now put her through, through mental pain. Mm. Through mental pain. And that is not obviously how Allah has commanded us to live with them mm. upon goodness. And yeah. that is not from goodness where you find that she, um, مثلاً, she's going through uh, nifas or she's going through pregnancy, she's going through giving birth and then all of a sudden because you can't uh, go to her or get any intimacy from her that you go to and go and get married it, it's not from justice and it's not from يعني, it's not from manhood or wujud, yeah. it's not in it um, obviously he doesn't have to let her know and she doesn't have to get permission from her and she'll never be happy asking even if he yeah. does ask for permission lacking the time that person, يعني, the timing can mean everything yeah. and the timing can mean everything and later on he won't have a foot to stand on if he does such a thing yeah Allah okay so what should a female do if she's 33 and not married she's living with her parents does she have to prioritize giving dawah to them first meaning that if their aqida is wrong and don't practice islam or she can get married uh, the, the, she can combine both there's nothing preventing or stopping her from doing both yeah. like i'll encourage her to get married as soon as possible and uh, given that it's a, it's, a, it's a process that can take time it can, yeah. and, it's, they, and they, they might not accept Islam immediately or they might not uh, come into the correct aqeed of al-sunnah yeah. immediately like in, you can carry on whilst getting married so al yeah. jam of course and yeah. Yeah. Even, even marriage is a means for, for da'wah when they have kids no, the best da'wah no. from, from kids sometimes Excellent. to their grandparents right. and yeah, stuff because grandparents tend to love their grandchildren more than their children <laughs> yeah, which is tabi'i yeah. so they'll have some sort of connection. connection okay what should be our criteria while choosing a big a life partner I mean, inshallah, it's no, choosing a, part, a spouse. Yeah, cho choosing a spouse. The messenger, with regards to the women, the messenger, yeah. sallallahu alaihi wasallam, advised the, the women and their families that إذا جاءكم من تقدون دينه وخلقه فزوجون. If a person whose religion you're pleased with and whose character you're pleased with, then allow him to marry your daughter. So these are the two reasons why a man should be married 
um, uh, his akhlaq, his manners, and his religion. A person who's upright, who prays Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who prays the faraid, the wajibat, and so on. No. Um, and also, if, if this person, obviously, she should ask his friends and family, pe people that know him, uh, ask him how his dealings are and how he is. Is he a person who's gentle? Is he a person who's kind and so on? How is his dealings with people? And if they've got, if he's got in-laws, and if she knows people who are already married into his family, maybe she can go and ask them, and yeah, his in-laws, yeah. his sisters are married or his brothers, maybe she can also go and ask them. Like in general, I mean, with marriage, it's, it's always a gamble because everyone, or in the majority of cases, when a person wants to get married, he's an angel or she's yeah, an angel yeah. and she's obviously got to mention everything that the other person wants to hear and then the true colours only come out afterwards. afterwards. So and even if they are honest as well, there's another aspect to this, which is that people change in the future. You know, their, people change. Their intentions it's change, so things happen, it's, their circumstances it's, change, it's, circumstances. And it's you not, know, their money, uh, things change. Yeah, you yeah, know, so you never know, you, you don't know. know. Exactly. Allah subhanahu knows a lot yeah. more, okay. so, which is why so. you do istikhara prayer, yeah. because yeah. you don't have a control over what's going to happen yeah. in the future. But yeah, I think, yeah, it's important. I think also important this topic is, you know, like you mentioned, just keep it simple. If someone comes in, they're generally, you're generally pleased with them. We've done the research. Mm. Don't over worry about, yeah. you know, mm. the, the future. Yeah, some, and also even in terms of, like, method, and uh, when, a pe when people do get married, it's, marriage is not something that you're, and you're always going to find the person that's perfect immediately. Yeah, you, know? yeah. you mold each other into the person that you want the other person to exactly, be. As long yeah. as there's a general kind of attraction to one another and yeah. general inclination, then later on you grow upon together, one another, yeah. you grow together yeah. and the relationship builds behind. Uh, as a young Muslim woman, I know what I want in a future spouse as I have a sister with a disability. I found an individual that ticks all my boxes and has said after marriage, when we have our, our home, my sister will have her own room. May Allah increase you in khair for your love for your sister and wanting to look after her. Our mm -hmm. home will be hers. When we have kids, inshallah, she will be a second mum to them. I have full faith and belief in him as I see how he treats his own family members. His siblings look up to him as a second father figure. He's on his dean, he has a great character. However, my parents believe marrying back home is the best option and find the fact and find the fact I may have found someone here to be disrespectful. How do I show them that it's not disrespectful but the best choice and only choice for me? Mm. Okay. Allah Alam, just try method and try talking to them, explaining to them that um, this individual is a righteous individual, a person who's got a good character, a person who's practicing the religion of Islam, and obviously tell them that you love them and explain to them that you're only doing this because you feel obviously it's right and you prayed istikhara, hopefully after you prayed istikhara, inshallah, and um, that you have confidence in. And also uh, speak to your older siblings if you've got any, uh, or your uncles or your aunties, and try getting them to convince your parents, try getting them to convince your parents to accept this individual insha'Allah. Um, a lot of the times it's a cultural thing where parents want their children to marry back home. Yeah. And a lot of the times they're not compatible, it's difficult yeah. because uh, the two people from different walks of life. So yeah. it, it's not fair on the person to say, uh, on the parents, or it's not fair on the person, on the sister to say she has to marry someone yeah. from back home. She may not even understand the language that exactly. they speak. Yeah. So she's trying maybe speaking to uh, some of the people that her parents respect yeah. uh, and try getting them on her side and so on and explaining to them. Because yeah. the parents will always see you as a child, so yeah, you someone you else say, there's nothing yeah. else now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but just to kind of close it, you're right. I mean, they can't force her to marry someone that she doesn't want to marry because no. from back home. No, if, yeah, no, forcing is not something, it's not permissible, and that nikah is not sahih. Yeah. You can't force a woman or can't force a daughter to marry someone. Uh, how, how do you deal with a family member or members of your family who aren't so accepting of you wearing a baya backslash niqab? Uh, Sheikh Sulaiman Hafidahullah was asked a similar question to this and he advised me, he said that Alhamdulillah this sister has done what was wajib upon her yeah. I put it on the niqab and the hijab and the abaya and so on so she has done that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has made wajib upon her and it is not permissible for her to listen to them and obey them There is no obedience to the creation when it comes to disobeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As for if they say, some of them say that the curse of Allah will be upon you, I will curse you if you don't take off and so on, then that curse isn't, it won't harm the yeah. person because that's the curse of an oppressor. And the curse of the oppressor is not accepted. The curse, uh, the curse of the ex uh, oppressor is not accepted. Yeah. Rather the dua of the oppressed 
will be accepted. Yeah. Uh, so it's not permissible for them to obviously do that. So she has to be patient, the Sheikh advised with, and she has to also carry on and showing them that um, that by her practice and her religion, she's actually a better person and a better Muslimah. Maybe she should try, or maybe she can try buying them gifts and smiling and being gentle with them, and also giving them da'wah, giving them lectures of the scholars. Uh, she shouldn't try getting into uh, an out or and out arguments, debate or arguments with them yeah. because yeah, especially if they're your mother or your father they just see you as nothing uh, they're, they're the child, you're, yeah. they're, you're, you're their yeah. child now yeah. Yeah. I mean even on this point it just even it, it, it made me think of the uh, is it Abu Huraira whose mother said that she's not going to yeah. so mm. you know parents they can try to use emotional blackmail on their kids yeah, they can. and it might be painful but you know, mm. Allah before everything else, Allah basically. Everything else, you know, the Abu Huraira done who he said to mm. his mom, what was the statement he said to her if you had however many lives or no, you know, no, I don't know. Don't know. Yeah, yeah. No. So in the end what mm. happened, he went to the Messenger of Allah, made dua mm. and then she became, she became she Muslim. Became, she became so Muslim, no. uh, if it's a principle and it's Islamic, yeah. obedience to Allah, your parents will inshallah yeah. make the off that Allah, Th that Allah guides, guides, them guides them because it's pain in you that yeah, they're the emotional, that, you know, the okay. thingy. But at the yeah. same time, you know, that you can't obviously you obey can't, them. You can't yeah, obey no. them. So make the off for them, make the off, make the off, and carry on in, on the path, inshallah. His mother was a very wealthy mother and he was punished by her. She punished him a lot. Yeah. Yeah. She punished him, punished him, and she locked him up in Makkah and so on. Yeah. She went through, he went through a lot of difficulties uh, just yeah. for the sake of Allah. Uh, how should we respond? How should we respond when men we don't know tell us to cover our face because it's a fitna? With this question, firstly, the Baba obviously he shouldn't be telling so, us to cover up anyway in the first place. Um, yeah, if he's not a family member, if he's member, not a family he's not, member, yeah. if he's not. No, if he's not a family member, if he's not a teacher or someone. But what's more concerning is how, I and mean, where are they interacting? What, where is, I mean, if, if it's a stranger that's walking past, it's, it's not common for a person walking past, metal in the supermarket, to just tell you to cover up. Maybe, so, maybe it's a chat of line. So maybe, yeah, <laughs> maybe, maybe you know, if it's that, then <laughs> like in. Um, with regards to if it's method and if it's a person that they, 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 they it seems like they're in the same area or same vicinity which obviously they shouldn't be um, lurking uh, obviously he has to lower his gaze as well yeah. he has to lazy, lower his gaze and she has to avoid or they both have to avoid um, being in those places where they may come into the opposite gender came come into contact with the opposite gender obviously a woman shouldn't beautify herself when she's going out and some of the scholars say if, there, if there's fit and, and if she's extremely beautiful and there's fit and that can come from it, then it may be wajib upon her or she should wear the niqab. Okay. Um, is, it, is going outside for getting fresh and exercise and contemplating Allah's creation a rewardable reason for a woman to leave her house? No, I mean, it's permissible for a woman to leave her house if there's a need, whether it's exercising, whether it's to work, to study, shopping, visiting family members. It's permissible to her, for her to leave the house. Like in the only one, that, what, what's not permissible is her going out just for the sake of going out. Yeah. So I mean, even on this point, I, I think it's important to realize even for a man, he's okay, he leaves the house because he's got work to so, do. He leaves the house because yeah. he's going to yeah. visit so, his family, he's going to yeah. visit brothers. But he doesn't leave the house just for the sake of leaving, the, sake of leaving yeah. the house to walk to yeah. idol. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. You know I mean? exactly. He leaves the house for, you know, yeah. for purposes. Yeah. So, so Whether it's meetings, it's not that's just for the sake of no, no. yeah. So he has to busy himself with something which will benefit him. As yeah. for going to your friend's house to watch a football game, and you're wasting leaving your family and staying all night and so on, going to watch a football game for an hour and a half. It's a waste of time. Yeah. And also a lot of brothers and sisters, they spend too much time, a lot of time in coffee shops. Sisters shouldn't be in coffee shops anyway, but like, and even for brothers, they spend a lot of time in coffee shops, yeah. tasting different coffees and going to different places and different restaurants. And, yeah. and it's not, it's, so it's not something that they should... You know, no, like coffee. It's not, yeah, it's not something that they should waste their time on all the time. Yeah, you know? yeah definitely. Uh, is it, so is going out to restaurants with sisters maybe after a lesson or just in general for catch up okay? as well as going for a walk every day for exercise both in and out of this lockdown period does this go against women not going out except necessary as for going out if it's necessary then she's allowed to go out if it's necessary for going out whether it's for a walk visiting family working and so on as we mentioned earlier on lacking as for going out to restaurants it is not from the etiquettes of a Muslim woman. It, it is not something that was practiced among in the Muslim Ummah for you know in the past generations and we shouldn't think that it's it, uh, everything that was practiced there was ancient and so on and, and backward and so on. Like, 
uh, the, 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 it wasn't practiced. The women would stay at home, and if they didn't have a need to go out, they would go out. Yeah. If they didn't have a need, if they had a need, like to go to restaurants and just to go to coffee shops for the sake of it, it's not from the etiquettes of a Muslim. She should stay, obviously, at her home. Or she can visit her friends in their homes and so on. That's us uh, yeah, that's, that's better. That's, that, that's better for them. Is it permissible, halal, to leave the home when necessary? Then are we sinned if we leave? Are we sinned if we leave if it is not necessary? The same answer. Same answer. So Allah subhanahu wa Do not go out. Do not display yourselves like the jahiliya pre-ignorance before Al Islam. Uh, no, it's a stay uh, in your homes. What's considered necessary example going for a walk to appreciate the creations of Allah, which is good for mental self care and spiritual health, and therefore is a form of ibadah. I'm, ass I'm assuming that this came up in the lecture or some, or some point. Yeah, but we talked about it. We just yeah. said it just now. We're yeah. going out for exercise. Same thing. Uh, yeah. uh, going out for exercise, going out, uh, walking, obviously, exercise, yeah. going out for uh, visiting family, shopping, study. Work and so on, visiting family members. That's that's all, always also yeah. considered the necessary. Lacking, lacking, with regards to exercise, it doesn't mean that they can take a football and go out to the local football pitch that's and start football. kicking a ball yeah. around. And recently, I was reading that there was a, a Muslim football team, um, with a Muslim women's football team, um, and obviously that's haram for them to be playing football in public where men will see their aura and so on. Yeah. And also they shouldn't obviously be running around in public as well. It's not from the etiquettes of of, the of, Muslim. Adab of a Muslim. No. So there are certain things that even it, there are certain things where it's not just about halal and haram. Yeah. So method in the scholars of hadith in the past, if a person didn't pray witr, they wouldn't take his testimony. Yeah. If a person walked around during those times without his head covered, yeah. they wouldn't take a hadith from him and yeah, so on. Yeah. So it, these are common things that are practiced within the community, customs and norms. Yeah. So it's not necessarily halal and haram, lacking. It's, it's it, not no, it's respectable, not, not decent. Respectable, no. Okay, um, considering it is haram for a woman to leave the house without a need, would it be permissible to leave the house and meet female friends in their homes or leave the house if you feel down for a walk up around our homes? No, it's permissible for them to, it's fine for them to visit one, one another in each other's homes, especially now, obviously, given the fact that we're locked down and a person yeah. can be stuck in a home on their own and so on. So it's fine for them to visit themselves, but obviously not at every single day that they're going out. Yeah. Um, and that's actually dangerous given the times we're living in now anyway, and given yeah. this community that we're living in. It's actually dangerous for them to be out anyway. Like it's permissible for them to visit one another, and so on. If if someone studies medicine, a sister works in a private clinic and ensures she's home before her husband, kids, is this permissible? No, it's fine as long as her and her husband have this agreement. That's fine. Uh, this is my second marriage to my husband who lives in another country. While I'm still here looking after my children for my first marriage because they are still at school age teenagers. My husband has given me a blanket permission to go out pertaining to my children's affair or having to work to go to the supermarket to buy food. Is that permissible? Sometimes I feel wrong to go out without telling him we are eight hours apart in terms of time difference. No, this is fine because he has given her a general and unrestricted uh, permission to go out and she's only, obviously only going out for the needs of her children or for the needs of herself, then it's permissible. She doesn't need to call him every, every time that she wants to go somewhere. given her permission. Allahu uh, Alam. My husband will like me to go back to go my husband would like me to go back to my country but my mother doesn't allow me because of my children's age when i told my husband about my mom's request he changed his mind and asked me to carry on staying here to look after my children until my youngest reaches the age of 18 he's currently or currently 14. i was disappointed but according to him even though i have to obey him we have we both have to obey our mother first as mother is the key to jannah he said am i right to do this according to islamic rules by the way my husband is turning 70 this year uh, as for obeying him, you're right to obey him, you're right to obey him, and he is right to help you in pleasing your mother. So what you've got is a good problem, it's not yeah. a bad problem. Like, alhamdulillah, as long as you know, both parties are okay and he's not, um, he's okay with you staying in this country, looking after your parents and so on, looking after your mother, because that's what your mother wants, that's fine. What if she's not okay, meaning that she wants haqa, haqa zawj, zawja? That's different because the issue was with the children yeah, and not going out. That's the difference. That's, that's different. for if she wants her haq, that's different. That, that, that's a different go to her yeah. Because if she's not getting her haq from him, that's, that's different. different. That okay, with so regards hard. to looking after the household, i.e., the children, does looking after your husband's wealth come under this? No, yes, it comes under this. The Messenger said, She's a guardian over her husband's house and her husband's wealth. And that's his wealth. As for her wealth, she can do what she wants with it. She doesn't mm. have to. 
I'm raising my niece and nephew as their father passed away and the mother does not want to raise them. May I reward you and make it heavy on your scale of these on Qiyamah. What are their rights and responsibilities and how could I guide them and raise them currently as their carer as well as their aunt? Now, first in terms of spiritually, in terms of religiously, then she has to make sure that she teaches them Al-Islam. She teaches them the correct aqidah, she sends them to madrasa, she teaches them the Quran. If she doesn't know, then she goes, sends them off to a madrasa and she gives them the correct Islamic tarbiyah. And she doesn't always spoil them because if she spoils them, then that's bad for them. It's not necessarily good for, to spoil children. As for financially, financially then it's wajib for her, her for, upon their mother to, 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 to support them financially. Like if, if she's refusing, if she's refusing to support them in terms of financial, financially, then she can obviously, uh, it come, the wajib is on her, it's obligatory upon her to look after her brother's children, That's her, the, she's obviously their auntie. And also it's a way of looking after, or preserving the legacy of, um, of her brother. Also the Messenger Sallallahu said that me and the person, the careful yatim that looks after the yatim, are like that in Jannah. So yeah. there's great reward for looking after the orphan, so she can have the intention of uh, looking after an orphan, have the intention of enjoying the kinship of her brother, Silat yeah. Rahim, and she'll be rewarded for all of that. Uh, all of the, yeah, yeah. so there's one, in there's, there's many intentions for this one action, and a lot of reward this, basically increases reward. the reward. Nah. Alhamdulillah. Allah. Uh, my child doesn't listen to me, screams a lot, and even hits her little brother, has become very aggressive. Mm. Children have tantrums and they go through phases, um, and they go through phases. They won't listen to everything that you're saying, uh, so you obviously have to be patient with them, make the earth for this child. As for them obviously hitting their little brother, then you obviously have to punish them accordingly, prevent them from playing and so on. And also these devices that they use, that might be a good thing to, it might be a good time to get rid of these devices and not allow them to use any of these devices. Uh, next question, is it permissible to hang things such as Alhamdulillah, SubhanAllah, Allah Akbar and the 99 names of Allah and the best Allah on the wall for purposes of reminders and for people to benefit? The, the scholars, when you go into, um, when you look into the fatah of the scholars, they all say it's not something that the Salaf did, it's not something that they, that they practiced. Mm. Um, so it shouldn't be done. And if it's done in order to, even for a reminder, it's not something that was practiced by the Salaf, and the best of guidance is the guidance of, of the Salaf. salaf. Um, and if it's done for Tabaguk, then that, it might even come into a bid'ah, if yeah. it's done for trying to get attain, Barakah. Yeah. Uh, attain barakah. Um, the only, now, as for method, for example, sometimes you're trying to get a child to memorize a hadith, so you put it next to their bed or the table that they revise, and that's different because yeah. you want them to, you're trying to get them to memorize it so that they, uh, they, they see this hadith constantly so that they can memorize it. And then obviously when you take it down, you put another hadith, so it's a way for them to memorize it. Uh, next Allah question, Allah. it's widespread amongst Asians to have Rahman as a surname. What's the ruling on this and does it have to be changed? Sheikh Ibn Uthaymeen rahimahullah says when asked about this question and similar questions is that if the, per, if the name doesn't have an Al, if it doesn't have an Al, or you're not naming this person this specific name because of the attribute that he has, then it's permissible to name him. Yani مثلا Aziz. Uh, if you're naming him just because of, for the sake of naming him Aziz, then it's fine. Like if you're saying he is Aziz, then Ibn Uthaymin says it's not permissible because only the name, only Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is the one that has the name and the attributes and are attributes. connected. And also we can't add Al the Sheikh says Rahmatullahi alayhi. Al like, meaning the Aziz, the, the Lord, na, yeah. the Lord or yeah. the this. Uh, and as for names like Allah and Al Rahman, scholars say that you can't. Uh, name people these names because these are names that are specific to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like it as for Kareem, as for Ra'uf and so on then they say it is permissible as for Habib or Rahman then that is also permissible as a scholar of Matan Sheikh Fawzai you find being asked a lot of times about Habib or Rahman and he says it's permissible to use okay. this sort of name um. What's the ruling on photography and vid videography? Uh, with regards to photography and videography, then as we're doing now, we're videoing this, it's live, it's going to stay up, it's going to be of educational benefit, inshallah, and da'wah. In that case, there's no problem in it. Uh, it's something which is, uh, you find the ulama, they permit and they do. Uh, photography, then, is an issue where the scholars have differed of the past, more so than the present, on, the, on whether photography comes under Taswir or not of drawing of your hand. 
Uh, the fatwa of Sheikh Othaymin, is, which is one that I follow personally, is he says it's not the same ruling as drawing of your hand, it's completely different. He, he says when you, he gives an example of a book, uh, he says this book for example, if I took this book and I photocopied it, I, is it my book or is it still Saeed's book? It's a photocopy of Saeed's book and it's not attributed to me, I can't say this is my book now because I've got a photocopy of it. So I haven't created the book, I haven't done anything apart from taking a snapshot of it, but it's still attributed to the author or the or who wrote the book and he gives that as an example for a photograph. But then he does go on now to say it takes the hukum of what it's used for. So it takes the hukum, but it's a, what's the, it, what, if it's used for something which is haram, then it becomes haram to take it and so on and so forth. That's the fatwa of Sheikh Uthaymin and that's the fatwa that I've, I personally follow and uh, the other, like we mentioned, there's other scholars that differ on that, on this mas'ala. Uh, next question, am I able to work in a free mixing environment if I apply the right hijab and if the job is halal? Uh, there's three things, the free mixing, the right hijab and the job being halal. It's, you have to work in a halal job and you have to obviously wear the hijab. As for the first, the, the first thing that the sister mentioned, it, it's not permissible to work in a free mixing environment, so a person should avoid working in a free mixing environment as much as possible. Regarding mahram, if I marry a man who, had pre who if I marry a man who was previously married, would his children be mahram for me? Also, if I adopt, would that child be a mahram? Now, the child of your husband from a previous marriage um, it becomes your mahram, so it's like your child. So you can, uh, when you're around him, you don't have to wear the hijab. When you're traveling, you can use him as a, you can take him as a mahram. You can obviously also be alone with them, and they are considered your, your 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 children. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, ma qad salaf. Also, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Wala yubdina zinatuhunna illa li bagulatihinna, aw abaihinna, aw abai bagulatihinna, aw abnaihinna, aw abnai bagulatihinna." All the sons of their husbands. Hus husband, so these says. are considered um, children. As for the scholars uh, mentioned that if it's a person, if uh, the, the, the wife of the husband is young in age and her son is also there of similar age if there's a fitna if you fear that there's a fitna then maybe you can take precaution and so on as for adopting if you adopt a child obviously their name you can't change their name obviously you can't um, they won't inherit you and there's no blood relation yeah. that's adopting not the child that we're yeah, referring that's to adoption. Like, the adoption and obviously they don't become your and so on. With regards to the hadith which says Allah would say to the woman who obeyed Allah in, all f in who obeyed Allah in all the five pillars of Islam and also obeyed her husband to enter paradise from whichever gate she wants. So my question is, does it matter which gate one enters Jannah with? If there is any significance to, be, to being given a choice since she's already been told to enter Jannah anyway? Well, the difference is firstly, uh, these in the Sunnah of the Messenger وسلم, we've been told that there are eight gates to Al Jannah, Mathan Rayyan for fasting, the gate for Siyam, Fire Salah, Zakah, Hajj, and Jihad, and so on. So, in authentic hadith, Abu Bakr asked the Messenger وسلم, after the Messenger mentioned this, that Abu Bakr said, Is there a person that will enter from all of these gates? Which shows the high aspiration, yeah, the himma of Abu Bakr. Anhu. No. And he's, the Messenger وسلم, said, Naam, and I hope for you to be from amongst them. So for a person to be called from all of the gates of Jannah, that is a virtue yeah, in, of itself. in of itself. That's, a, a, yeah. that's a more a goodness. Um, obviously, if a person, imagine if a person was to be called by, مثلاً, if there are 10 noble scholars living in one area, if you're called by all of them, you would yeah. feel as if, mashallah, you would yeah. be proud of yourself yeah. and pleased and so on. So imagine being called by from all of the gates of Allah Jalla wa Alam Jannah Barak wa Alaikum Jazakallahu Khairan Do you need to take a break or? No, it's Okay uh, The next group of questions is about hijab and al-libas which is clothing So number one Can we remove our gloves if we are not allowed if we are not allowed them for my A-level exams and do the gloves need to cover our whole hand? If you're wearing gloves now the gloves need to cover the whole hand Lucky, it's not wajib upon the women to cover their hands, it is not wajib upon them to cover their hands, so she's allowed to take them off if Mithala she's not allowed. And she's, if she is it obligatory it. for Muslim women to wear gloves or to cover their hands in the presence of men? 
Uh, no, the gloves are completion, completion, and it's completing, completing the complete hijab of the Muslim woman. Like, and it is not wajib upon her to cover it up. And if she does wear the gloves, they have to be. They should be the same color as the the, the hijab, because obviously they won't be eye catching that way. Like, if she's got black hijab and white gloves. It's going, it's, it's going to stand out now. Are jewelry watches and nail polish considered beautification to a, to a woman's jilbab? Now, all of these are beautification apart from the watch. Apart from the watch, all of these are beautification. So, for example, nail, van, nail polish or, or henna and all of this, it, there's, uh, they are a, a form of beautification. And if she does have no varnish or no polish or henna on, then it's wajib for her to wear gloves. gloves. Why? Because that is a form of beauty. Just like to point on um, with regards to nail varnish, if she does put nail, uh, nail polish on, then she can't make wudu with it. She needs to remove it yeah. uh, when she's making wudu because it prevents uh, the water. water from reaching uh, the, the hands and then the, the nails lacking. With henna, it's not the same. Uh, when is it permissible for a woman who wears niqab to show two eyes when going out? Can a woman choose to uncover both eyes out of preference? The niqab in general doesn't cover both eyes anyway. The niqab, she can, both her eyes are seeable, she can see through her eyes anyway. Yeah. The niqab doesn't cover the eyes. Okay. Uh, is henna on hands considered beautification? No, it's considered beautification and if she, wear, if she has henna on her hand then it's wajib for her to Cover them up. Can a woman wear can a woman wear a blazer with a abaya, loose fitting female cut? I the abaya is loose fitting female cut, I'm assuming. The what? Can a woman wear a blazer with a abaya? Jacket. A jacket, yeah. Under the hijab, yeah, yani, or uh, it just says or loose fitting. Yeah, well, loose as for, fitting as for if she can she, a blazer or a jacket, she should wear that above or wear the hijab above this the blazer or the jacket. Because no matter what, like no matter how loose it is, it will always kind of restrict the hijab, it always gives a shape um, to her body. Like, and sometimes there's really baggy jumpers, long jumpers, which are really baggy, yeah. that don't affect or that don't restrict the hijab. So that is permissible. Like, in it, with the hijab, uh, if she's wearing a jacket on top, or if she's wearing a jumper or whatever, uh, or blazing, she should wear the hijab on top. Yeah, so it covers the hijab covers on top. But some women say it makes me look big and so on. I like, yeah. shouldn't give her to that. Uh, can a woman wear a skirt, e.g. with a large top on top, everything's covered? And the hijab must cover the whole body. So if it's a two-piece hijab, top and bottom, then that's fine. And I can ask for a long, uh, just a scarf and a loose hijab, then that's a loose uh, skirt, then that's not a hijab. A hijab is a garment that covers from head to toe. Uh, can a woman wear sandals outside, given that she's wearing socks or something similar to cover her feet? No, as long as she can wear it, as long as her feet are covered. It was said that women are not allowed to wear men's clothes, so what is included in the clothes of men? Anything that is specific to men is from the clothing of men. For example, suits. For example, shimals, or imams like this. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if it's a fashion nowadays. Like in, uh, about five, six years ago, it was a fashion to wear the red scarf or the, yeah, the, the, Palestinian, one, yeah, the yeah. Palestinian one. So yeah. anything that is specific to men is not permissible for women to wear yeah. and anything that is specific to women then it is not permissible for men to wear the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in the hadith of ibn abbas la'ana allahu mutashabbihina min ar-rijali bin nisa' wal mutashabbihati min an-nisa' bi ar-rijal the messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam said curse that may the curse of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be upon the men who resemble the the women and the women who resemble the men as for clothing that is for both genders then it's fine as a uh, matter and tracks of bottoms. Sometimes you find in the male section tracks of bottoms, and you find the female, female section tracks of bottoms. So that's not to shab yeah. uh, tracks of bottoms, for example. Um, but obviously, she's going to be shopping in the women's section. Like, and obviously, when she's outside, she's wearing the tracks of bottoms under the hijab. Are women allowed to wear tracks of bottoms or jeans if they are not tight? Uh, no, nah, I mean, inside the house, in front of the husband, they're allowed to wear uh, jeans or je child tracks or bottoms or whatever it may be, whether they're tight or not tight. Lacking at uh, the presence of the father and the, uh, the other mahagim, the brothers and so on, it's better to keep it loose. Some of our may show. Sure. What's the ruling of women wearing suits or trousers for work or school? It's haram. It's not permissible for women to wear the clothing of men. It's obligatory wajib for women to cover themselves up. Um, and obviously they can't wear trousers. If they wear trousers, they are resembling the men. If they wear suits, they are resembling the men. And obviously they can't have the hijab and the trousers on. However, if they're wearing this, the trousers or jeans under the hijab, then it's permissible for them to do so. 
sometimes it might be better for them, yani. Yeah. yeah. Also, are you allowed to wear a small amount of perfume so that's unlikely to be obvious to others when walking outside? I bet them it's haram. It's haram to wear any sort of perfume. The Messenger وسلم, said, Well, Margaret, with the start of the Margaret, be majlis, be majlis, if he is an if, if she puts on atag perfume and she comes by a group of people that are sitting or a group of people, and then she is a zani, will ayyad be la, she's a fornicator. So the punishment is severe for the woman that goes out with atag on, whether it's other, whether it's perfume, whether, regardless of um, the type of perfume. So it is not permissible for her. To do so, uh, one of the characteristics of a Muslim is chastity. Could you please explain in detail what chastity is and what are and what aren't chaste acts? Uh, the mas this issue of chastity in the, uh, it pertains to a Muslim woman, then it's everything that protects her and safeguards her honor as a Muslim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has honored uh, the Muslim, male and female, and that honor is the topic of nobility, right? And uh, you, as a Muslim, you feel proud that Allah has chosen you and Allah has given you this uh, this position of, of having of honor and you maintain that in, in every aspect of your dealings from the highest level from how you dress how you walk how you speak to how you in, even how you even engage with other people also as well uh, with regards to the your yourself, your household, you, you know you're in a position or a place which is dubious or which is going to put tuhma or doubt upon you and these, some of these principles they apply to men and to women as well with regards to being honourable and being noble and having uh, a high standard of character and stuff like that it applies to men and women with regards to where they position themselves, where they are, where they go uh, and obviously the most important one is, is safeguarding your private parts from zina I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us and our families and our mm. from falling into zina because it's from the kaba'id and from the things which are from the uh, fawahish which uh, are uh, uh, the, the fitna of our times basically now Can a woman show her upper arm to her father and brother wearing short sleeves? With regards to what she can wear in the house with her maharim it's what's considered the norm what's considered the norm so method the parts that you would, that would usually appear during wudu when a person is making wudu so method and uh, but the bottom part of the, uh, the, the arm whatever yeah. is underneath the, um, the, the the elbow her head her neck and so on and obviously her face and her, and her and her feet and so on that is considered the norm in mm. the roof according to normal people as yeah. for those people that have illnesses that's different yeah, that's like in, normally that's what's considered the norm so even short sleeve method and dresses and so on that's permissible as long as it's loose and it doesn't yeah. uh, make her uh, give a figure to her anger. No, Alhamdulillah, with that we finished that sec the third set of questions. No, no. Alhamdulillah, we got on the fourth set of questions yeah. which is pertaining to knowledge and etiquettes. Advice to someone trying to wear niqab and advice you give to someone who wants to seek knowledge but does not know where to begin. As for the niqab, then it's one of the biggest signs of Iman and it's one of the biggest signs that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants good for this individual where he puts in her heart love for the hijab, love for the niqab. Why? Because she's obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and covering herself up and she's putting herself in harm's way in order to practice Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's religion because it's not easy for our sisters uh, who are wearing the niqab or wearing the hijab to be walking out in, in the streets as we know because they're Obviously, always been called, um, and they've always been labelled uh, mm. things that are are not befitting. Lacking, she shouldn't obviously be held back. She should obviously know that Islam started as something strange, and it will end as something strange. For so glad tidings to Zulqurabat. No doubt that when she's wearing the niqab and she's sat on a train full of non-Muslims or even Muslims who are not covered up, then she's going to be a stranger. She stands out. Like she shouldn't uh, uh, be grieved by that or she shouldn't fear because she's obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that is the guidance and the hadi or the sunnah of the companions, the female companions of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so your example is Aisha radiallahu anha and the wives of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the wives of the male companions, the, the, the wives of the companions of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that's where your role model is as for the second part in seek knowledge, then it's important to seek knowledge. Lacking, a lot of the times people don't know where to seek knowledge. And as we see in the question, she doesn't know where to seek knowledge. 
Um, I believe uh, Sheikh Abdul Wahid has been doing a Maktaba series. So listening to those discussions kind of give me yeah, kind of some sort of benefit in terms of where to start and so on. Mm. Like in um, Method, and if she was to come to the college, I'm sure uh, Sheikh Abdul Wahid and the other brothers wouldn't direct her in how to seek knowledge and how to start. And there are courses that are available for every level. Yeah, and they're online as well. Okay, how can I balance between seeking knowledge and seeking Islamic knowledge and secular studies? Um, organize your time, balance your time, and take, an, take advantage of the lessons that are online. Maybe the, 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 the portal that is online as well. Take advantage of it. Alhamdulillah, a lot of things are online now. Yeah. So it's important to balance your time. Where there's a will, there's a way. And you have to also remember that the Messenger said, Talabul ilmi fariditun ala kulli muslimin. Seek knowledge is wajib upon every single Muslim. So the knowledge of how to pray, the tawheed of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the how to fast and how to pay zakah and so on, all of these are types of knowledge which are wajib for every single Muslim to mm. learn. So she has to obviously try balancing. Obviously, it's difficult given the environment and society that we live in. Like in, where there's a rule, there's a way. Yeah. Can I travel or make hijrah to a Muslim country, even though my mahram, even though my mahram is not with me? There's, there's no hijrah, I think. There. Hijab, make hijrah. Make hijab, hijrah. Sorry. May, may, yeah, says, make hijrah. She's trying. Maybe she's trying to say make hijrah to a Muslim country. The yeah. Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in authentic hadith, "لا يحل لمرأة تؤمن بالله واليوم الآخر أن تسافر مسيرة يوم وليلة." إلا مع ذي محرم إن is not permissible for a person for a woman who fears Allah سبحانه وتعالى and the last day to travel without a محرم. So the issue of محرم is extremely important to the extent that the scholars say if a woman doesn't have a محرم, Hajj is not wajib upon her. Yeah. She doesn't have to perform Hajj, and she won't be held to account if she dies without having performed yeah, she's not Hajj, well. and she can't perform Hajj with a group of women, even mm. if there are hundred women, she cannot perform Hajj. And she can obviously um, travel alone, and that's obviously for Hajj. So anything other than Hajj, then it is not permissible. Um, as for what some people say, that if you're going to an airplane, you're getting into the airport and there's a lot of people on board, and then when you get to the other side, uh, these are intellects, logic, we can't uh, crush that with. The hadith of the Messenger sallallahu so this hadith is clear cut, and says that a woman is not allowed to travel, travel yeah. without a mahram without a mahram. As for the issue of hijrah, then that's something that she should consult or speak to a scholar, uh, and he may be able to give her an individual fatwa. I'm looking in, into her case and her yeah. situation. I think there's a, there's another important point that you just raised, which is uh, fatwa are to your individual circumstance, and it applies to you. What some people what may do, they may f hear that a fatwa is given. They say, okay, I'm going to make qiyas mm. and that applies to me and I'm going to, I'm going to also take that. Uh, so there's, you need to differentiate between the general, which might be a general ruling, and the specific case which is f for a person based upon their circumstances. Mm. Uh, which is why a lot of people make a, a common mistake they make is they might go on a Q&A website, mm. read the fatawa and apply it like they've learnt the, yeah. the deen basically, yeah, not understanding that yeah. is for a context even for a place perhaps some some of the scholars actually i remember some of the teachers saying that uh, in in saudi they have nurun al adab where at 9 p.m they've got a live question and answer session i came across some teachers saying that it shouldn't be the case they shouldn't put that live yeah because if a alim or scholar gives a fatwa and he says and he places conditions on a certain ruling if this happens in this 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 situation, then it's permissible. Yeah. The army, the common person, will listen to the fatwa, and they will say, "No, I'm a sheikh, God, it's, it's permissible. No, the sheikh says permissible. <laughs> they forget all the conditions, and they forget the all the conditions and the, the situation. circumstances. Yeah. So a fatwa is different to a ruling. So, for for us to pick up, for kitab al talaq yeah. And to talk about the ahkam of talaq, when talaq happens, yeah. when it doesn't take place and so on, and the wordings used, that is different to a fatwa. That is different to when a person is actually seeking, seeking a fatwa or a religious ruling for uh, uh, something that happened between her and her husband or yeah. between yeah. two individuals. No, so a fatwa is different to... Okay, everyone around me is from my jahiliya past and it's hard to cut them off as I've known them for a long time. They don't encourage me to do bad, but they don't practice a deen and they always remind me of my past and don't accept I have changed. I'm not friends with any practicing sisters, so I find it hard to just go back to my old friends. So I find it hard 
and I find it hard and just go back to my old friends. Mm. Can you give me some advice, inshallah? Now, I'm first going to advise you to avoid the company, avoid their company for a while. Avoid their company. Uh, try increasing your Iman by praying the five daily prayers, by praying the Sunnah prayers, by praying the night prayer, the Witr, Salat al Duha, fasting Monday, to Monday and Thursdays, paying Zakah and so as, as Sadaqah and so on. Increase your Iman as much as you can because once your Iman increases, you naturally stay away from these things, and the, the, your Iman increasing is determined for you to stay away from these individuals. Um, and by going to them, you although they're not encouraging you to do bad things, like and it could be a door for you to carry on doing what they're doing because it seems like they haven't accepted her for the person that she has become. She's yeah. no longer that she's person. No longer she's person. no longer that person that they used to know. So she has to um, be careful and not hang around with them. And alhamdulillah, there's a lot of sisters um, that are upon goodness, upon khayr, yeah. that she can possibly come into contact with. Also, she should attend classes. She should attend classes. Um, and these classes will uh, help her meet new sisters, inshallah, who she can um, who she can keep who can keep company with, who will encourage her to do good. And also she should make dua. She should make a lot of dua that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives her can make give, makes her firm. Uh, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to say, Allah ya maqalib al quluk tabit qalbi ala dinik or uh, turn of the hearts, make my heart firm upon your religion. Wallahu alam. I'm starting a journey of improving myself as a Muslim and I need some guidance. What are the ways in which a Muslim should interact and behave in society? That requires a whole lecture. Yeah, yeah that requires a whole lecture. So listen to the lecture. Listen to the lecture. Proceeded. Proceeded. Like in general, fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, seek knowledge, attend the classes, attend the conferences, um, increase in your worship, your voluntary fast, charity, night prayer, keep good company, um, observe the hijab and so on, and read a lot of books on how the Muslim woman should act. And I'll mention some of these in a minute, inshallah. Okay, brilliant. Uh, what are the recommended books sisters read to gain more knowledge about the important women in Islam? What books should sisters read to gain more knowledge about the women in, in Islam? Uh, with regards to the, 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 the first part of the question, there's a book called Women Around the Messenger, I believe. Yeah. And that is a good book um, in order to know uh, some of the companions, female companions of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As for in general, uh, benefiting yourself and looking at the etiquettes of a believing woman, there are some books. Um, there's a book entitled 20 Pieces of Advice to My Sister by Sheikh Badr al Atayb, Hafidahullah. Uh, there's a book entitled A Piece of Advice and Admonition for the Women by Sheikh Abdul Zahir al Badr, Hafidahullah. There's a book, a treatise on or a book on hijab by Sheikh Munir Thaymin, Rahimahullah Ta'ala. And there's a book uh, entitled My Advice to the Women. Uh, who Umm Abdullah, the daughter of Sheikh Muqbili min Hadi al Wadi, rahmatullahi alayhi rahmatan wasi'a. Excellent. Why is it a must to follow a specific madhhab from the four of them Imam Ahmed, uh, Shafi'i, Malik, and Imam uh, uh, Abu Hanifa, and not all of them or other great scholars? They all clarified and made it easy for us to understand and act upon giving evidence from the Quran and Sunnah. Uh, the, 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 bot, the, the end part of the question answers the first part of the question yeah. um, in a way. But it's not wajib upon anyone to follow a madhab. Yeah. It's not wajib upon any Muslim to follow a madhab of a certain alim, a certain scholar. Um, it's only wajib to follow the Messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Yeah. That's who Allah jalla wa ala sent. So it's wajib to follow the Quran and the Sunnah. Lakin, the what is the role of these madhab, these different schools of thoughts uh, in the fiqh of Islam? It is only a way to understand, to digest, dissect and understand the different ahadith and the verses of the Qur'an of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala pertaining to fiqh al-ahkam that are found in the hadith, in the hadith of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mm. and in terms of the ayat of ahkam in the Qur'an of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in general the understanding of the kitab and the sunnah. So these madahib, it's not wajib to follow them. It's wajib to follow the Qur'an and the sunnah. However, these madahib are based on the Qur'an and the Sunnah. Okay. These madahib are based on the Qur'an and the Sunnah. So people shouldn't think that the Qur'an and the Sunnah are on one side of the scale and then on the other side there is the four madahib. Yeah. These madahib are based on the Qur'an and the Sunnah. In, and in general, you will find that 
there's a stronger opinion in every madhab, in every mas'ala. So yeah. there are different masail, different issues where you would say the Hanafi madhab is stronger or which is closer to the Sunnah yeah. in terms of the evidence or uh, the Hanbali yeah. madhab or the Shafi'i madhab or the Maliki madhab. So these madhab help a person understand the religion of Islam, especially in terms of fiqh. Because these madhahib are madhahib fiqhiyya, la aqadiyya. It's madhahib which are pertaining to fiqh, uh, on ibadat and mu'amalat and so on, transactions and dealings and worship. Like in the not madhabs that are to do with aqidah. Yeah. Not madhabs that are to do with aqidah. So it's not wajib to follow any of these madhab, madhabs. Like in they all, they all, they are all based upon the Quran and the Sunnah. And there were other imams who had other madhabs as well during yeah. their time, before their time and after their time lacking their students uh, let them down and their students did not carry, not carry on their yeah, legacy, legacy. Uh, with uh, Naam obviously in contradiction to these four Imams Rahimahullah ta'ala Alhamdulillah, Barakallah Fikum Alhamdulillah, that's all the questions from the past five weeks uh, Okay, these, the next sets of questions are from the listeners on YouTube or the, all those watching but uh, before you do, Inshallah we want to make this something regular, inshallah. Make the other that we're able to do this maybe fortnightly or monthly at the least. Uh, and show your support. If you're on YouTube now and you're watching, click the, what's it, the like button or the little notification. What is it? So that we know that this is something which you're going to... Turn on post notifications. Turn on post notifications and click the like or whatever it is that you need to do to make sure that we know that you're going to be attending if we do this every other week. Uh, that's really important because, uh, for you know, inshallah, it's, it's not. If you, if I took a, had a camera and I was to show you the setup, it's not something which takes a lot of effort. You got Zach over there doing this thing, so inshallah, we're going to go to the questions now with from YouTube. Let's let's take them inshallah. And, and again, if uh, we're able to answer, Osad uh, Saeed or myself, alhamdulillah. If not, then la adri is nisf al ilm. It's half of knowledge. Now. So the first question is: whilst you are in a state of um, Janub. Um, so if you can recite Al-Kar instead of reciting the Quran, does this also include reciting Surah Al-Mulk in the night as it's part of the Al-Kar? Father. For Janub. Father. Uh, Bismillah. The first thing is if you're at home in your Janub, then you're in a position where you can make Ghusl. And knowing that you're going to wake up to pray Fajr in the morning, it's better you're going to make a ghusl before you go to sleep, as this was also the son of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So in the first instance, uh, there's no reason for you not to make a ghusl. Uh, with regards to the question about making adhkar and making dua, uh, the, when you make dua from the Qur'an, Rabbi Zirni Ilma, that's the ayah of the Qur'an, but you're saying you're asking Allah to increase your knowledge, for example. Rabbi Khfirli, you might be making dua from the Qur'an, but it's a dua. This is a whole surah that you're reciting. Okay, so it's not specifically a dua that you're asking Allah for, you're now reciting Qur'an. Uh, so in this case, Wallah Ta'ala A'lam, make ghusl and recite Surah Al-Mulk, inshallah, and then get the benefit that you're desiring. In with, in with addition to following the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, that's my advice on that. No. In a previous video, the Bulugh al Maram was mentioned. Would you recommend the youth to study and read this book? Sure. Father. <laughs> Father. Uh, Bulugh al Maram is a book that needs a teacher. I mean, every book, generally speaking, needs a teacher. Uh, when it comes to fiqh, for example, because you're speaking about ahkam, and the scholars they say they used to speak about uh, the impermissibility of a layman, a person that's not edu not knowledgeable, to pick up Bukhari and open it and read it. Sahih Bukhari. That's what they used to say. Uh, and that's because you have a hadith of ahkam, you have loads of... So the point is, a book like Bulugh Muram, you should definitely have it. You should definitely seek to study it, to learn it, because it teaches you fiqh of your deen. It's the best book on ahkam, as uh, we mentioned in, I think, the previous talk about, if you memorize mm -hmm. Bulugh and mm -hmm. Zaid, yeah. you're in a position to, to give a tawa. Right, but memorizing it and understanding it, it's not just memorizing it or it's not just reading it, you need a teacher to, to explain it now. What is the ruling on preventing further pregnancies after five children, for example, in order to focus on raising those five children properly? Further. Uh, inshallah, the hukum of, of, of having a break so you can focus on uh, managing five children is permissible because that's a valid reason too. Uh, to take contraception as long as it's not going to harm you as is mentioned before. No, what I'll tell Alan.
what is the best way to seek protection for a child? Um, what specific occur for that protection? For the last one, first this time. What was the question again? What, what is the best way to seek protection for a child? Uh, we dua upon them. We uh, we dua upon them when they're going out. That is a dua that the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to read upon Hassan and Hussein whenever they'd be going out, so holding their head and reciting this dua. Uh, also taking the means, physical means. For example, a lot of people, they post their children online. Um, they put their children on WhatsApp, on their WhatsApp status or WhatsApp profiles. And these are sort of things that can increase the ayn, increase the evil eye. So a lot of people, although they don't want evil, or they don't want to harm the person, but many of them won't say, MashaAllah. And the people that are seeing this, maybe it's people who don't have children, who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hasn't blessed with children. So uh, we see a lot of time, times on social media that one of the reasons for sihr, the evil eye to be common, is for people to display the blessings that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given them in that manner. For example, if they're eating, they put their food on WhatsApp or on their status, which is ridiculous. Like in, the same for children as well, and they will put their video, put videos of their, the time that they spend with the children and so on. So by avoiding putting them on social media, um, even on WhatsApp profiles and so on, and making da'a for them in general, and also making da'a for them when they go outside, and teaching them the adhkar for going outside. Allahu Akbar. Yeah. Next question, what is the ruling for a wife if her husband left or deserted the home for more than six months? For them. Oh, what is the ruling for a wife? Meaning, if, uh, her, if her husband has left the home for more than six months. Uh, uh, Bismillah. With regards to deserted the home, I'm assuming that he's not given her nafaka. I'm assuming that she's he's tr she's trying to contact him and he's not fulfilling her right. Uh, otherwise, it's not des deserting. Uh, deserting that's giving the impression that there's he's he's left her. Mu'allaqa, without divorcing her either, and without, without, giving, without giving her her rights, without divorcing. In this case, she has to uh, seek recourse with a Qadi or a, a Islamic Sharia Council. She had to uh, uh, contact him and to intervene on, on, on her behalf. No. Wala Next question. In London, it is quite hard to find a female only environment workplace. Can I work in a mixed environment whilst not mixing more than necessary if I'm paying for uni to avoid um, riba? Fadalakh. <laughs> Uh, with regards to uh, that's, that conversation, there's a lot to, that question there's a lot to unpack. Uh, free mixing is impermissible. Uh, and going to university, uh, unless if your parents have told you to go to university, for example, then there's their obligation to pay for you. You don't have to work to go to, uh, go to university. Uh, it's a lot of things to unpack, but generally speaking, stay away from free mixing. It opens up a door fit now. University itself has free mixing, you go in there as well. Uh, inshallah, look for a job which is going to maintain your honor and dignity as a Muslim, and that's the most important thing. All I can say, the question about chastity and about hijab, take that this is your honor, and your environment should always be uh, something that's going to protect your honor as a Muslim. Allow you to maintain your honor as a Muslim by maintaining your chastity, maintaining your nobility, which is in your hijab and in, and in your identification as a Muslim. So wherever that's compromised, those are places that you try to stay away from, unless you got, unless you have no choice. If you have no choice, then necessity uh, uh, is forcing you. But when you have a choice, you avoid it. We'll take two last questions, inshallah. Um, how do I give advice to family members when they do something sinful? For instance, if they go out with perfume. How do I give? How do I give advice to family members when they do something sinful, such as going out with perfume? You give advice to them, you give da'wah to them. You mentioned the hadith of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam pertaining to not going out whilst wearing perfume and so on. And you obviously have to bear in mind how you're giving them or how you're advising them. So for example, the way you would advise your older sister won't be the same as the way you would advise your younger sister. Um, the way you would speak to your mother won't be the same as the way you'd speak to your siblings. So maintain a balance in terms of how you speak to them and also um, mention to them that the Messenger وسلم, said this or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this in this verse and try to connect them to the Quran of Allah Jalla wa ala. <clears throat> and the sunnah of the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam
نعم ما دعاء ما دعاء فذا ما دعاء فذا ما دعاء فذا ما إن شاء الله يدعاء is going to be answered because of your love and your concern now. And also to be patient with yeah. to be patient when takes time so when giving دعوة to your family and to anyone in general. And in no, you don't expect everyone to give you a response immediately. Some yeah. of the Anbiya, some of the Prophets of Allah Jalla wa ala, uh, they were killed by their people. Some of the Prophets of Allah will be raised Yawm al Qiyamah and no one will be with them. Yeah. So it is not wajib for them, it is not a must that they follow you. They may disobey you and they may disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Like in your job is to carry on, or your role is to carry on giving da'wah carry on advising them to fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and wait and yani don't, don't yeah. be hasty there's a lot of questions but we'll take one last one inshallah I have family members that constantly belittle me in my journey towards seeking knowledge and wearing the correct hijab first and foremost I make dua how would I deal with them and still keep ties alhamdulillah inshallah your majahid fi sabilillah you're doing a struggle in the way of Allah, so Allah is going to help you and Allah is going to make it easy for you. And inshallah, uh, again, this is a test of your Iman and inshallah you're going to persist in seeking knowledge because it's with knowledge that you're able to illuminate and educate and guide them. And they're in need of it more than they realize. So the first thing is to realize that what you're doing is something which is praiseworthy and not to lose hope or not to give up. With regards to how you're going to guide them, you're going to guide them, inshallah, through your actions, you're going to guide them through good speech, you're going to guide them through knowledge. And sometimes it, it may be the case that you're silent for, while you're on a journey of taking knowledge so that you can, when you do give them uh, benefit, you've benefited them with wisdom as well as with knowledge, because knowledge needs wisdom. Sometimes having knowledge, uh, a person puts it in the wrong place. Right? So you may have knowledge but you don't have wisdom, so you're now going to harm instead of benefit. Your knowledge has to be coupled with wisdom, and wisdom comes with time and patience. So inshallah it might be the case that you just do your thing, you carry on seeking knowledge, you know, you put up with the ridicule and stuff like that, you're patient. And then inshallah the time comes, they're going to, they're going to turn to you and say, what's the ruling of this? How do I do this? How can I? Because they see that you've become a person that's attained knowledge. You're a person that's become respected for your knowledge. In that time they'll be turning to you and you'll, you'll, Allah is going to raise you inshallah, because Allah raises the people with knowledge, as is one known. No, no. No. Also, just have patience. The Messenger وسلم, was mocked. The Messenger وسلم, was mocked by his people. The companions were mocked. They were beaten. Alhamdulillah, you're not being beaten. Yeah. Um, sh they were beaten. They were harmed. Uh, they were killed. Lakin, uh, Alhamdulillah, you're not being physically harmed, hopefully, inshallah. And hopefully, you won't be killed. Uh, so, you have to know, obviously, Allah says, Walladina jahadu fina lanahdi annahum subulana, those who strive for us, then Allah Jalla wa will guide them to their path, uh, to his path. Um, as for seeking knowledge, a lot of people, for some reason, the elders, especially the elders in the community, they frown or look down upon the person that seeks knowledge. So, you could be a doctor and you're going on looking about Tahaga uh, and so on. So, they, they often do that, lacking all of the praise that has been mentioned for knowledge. In the Quran and the Sunnah is for knowledge of the Quran and the Sunnah, knowledge of the Sharia. Man yuridi Allah bihi khayran, yufaqihu fi al-din. Whoever Allah Jalla wa Ala wants good for, He gives him understanding of the religion. The Messenger said, "Sallallahu alaihi wasallam, insalik al-tariqan yaltamisu fihi ilman." Sahla Allahu lahu bi al-tariqan al-jannah. The one who takes a path to seek knowledge, then Allah Jalla wa Ala will make a path easy for him to seek uh, to attain uh, paradise. So with this knowledge, you're attaining paradise. You, you are in jihad. So don't look at what's after you seek knowledge. What you're currently in is jihad fi sabilillah. Oh. What you're currently in is you're seeking knowledge. Some of the scholars, you know, there are different fitting, there are different things or obstacles that can prevent a person from seeking knowledge. Some of the scholars of the past, they were very poor. Mm. So they weren't they're able to go to tra travel, travel the lands to or go to certain places yeah. because uh, they weren't able to financially. However, they strived, you know, and they, they took them time and so on. Sufyan uh, Thawri, I believe it was, used to serve the Hujjaj on the way to Mecca, once seek knowledge, you know, and he yeah. was a alim, and look at what he, he became. And yeah. these people, they will only mock you for a certain period of time. Yeah. Trust me, they will only mock you for a certain period of time. When, they, when they're traveling and they don't know how to pray, they will ask you. Yeah. When they don't know how to wipe their socks, they will ask you. When they're pregnant and they don't know what to do, yeah. they'll come to you and ask you. Yeah. So the uh, end of result, well, no. And I, I guess another point as well, but, um, it, it, 
try to empathise with them. Perhaps it's coming from a good place. Our parents are not good for us. Okay, they look and look at the dunya. And they think that, for example, okay, you're going to seek knowledge, but you're not going to be able to earn a living, you're not going to be able to be independent, you're not going to get a job. It's a, there's that mentality as well that they have, which is cultural and it's based upon their lived experience. So, you know, uh, be patient with them as well, in your dealing with them, knowing that it's, inshallah, coming from a good place, even though the action is wrong. And then, inshallah, again, you know, your persistence and your uh, perseverance and your patience, inshallah, will be rewarded. And, and, and that's, that's a test of your patience. Inshallah, we're going to stop there. Uh, again, make sure before you uh, tune out that you uh, hit the like button or whatever it is that needs to be done so that we can make sure we know that you're going to be attending if we you know, put this on every two weeks, inshallah. First of all, I want to say Jazakumullah khair and thank you very much, Barakul Fikr, for coming. Inshallah, it was uh, a beneficial. Inshallah, sit in and ask Allah to uh, make it heavy on your scale of goodies and your qiyam on my scale of goodies and on the attendees and everyone that's involved in it. Barakul Fikr, Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah. Alaikum Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah.